Okay, Zoom should hopefully be. So, Valentin, let's make sure that everyone is on the WhatsApp group. Yes, but let's do that in the pause. In the pause, very during the break. Um, Wait, this computer is not up to date. Oh. So I'm trying to get the live stream to be working, oh. but it. Um... Okay. Um, I okay. So I don't think YouTube likes me trying to record on Zoom simultaneously. So I will just use Zoom for now and okay. hope it works. Um, so Zoom should be recording to the cloud, and then from there we should be yes. able to access it, right? Are you on Zoom right now? Yes, I'm on Zoom right now. So it's not. Because there are participants. No, I have not sent a link, so it's not going to be live. But okay. hopefully the Zoom recording, if I send it to okay. Valeria, will work. Um. Okay. So welcome back. Uh, so today we are going to do. Oh, sorry, paragraph two. And this is the problem is named after Sommerfeld who was the first to solve it by a method that's completely different from what we are seeing today. Um, so Sommerfeld's half plane problem. Okay, and first, of course, we need to formulate our problem. So 2.1. Okay, so let U n as last week we have a function that looks like this. Over here, like this. Okay. Um, which PDE does the function have inside? The one that we've seen last week, Hamilton yeah. equation. Oh. Exactly. So this is called Hamilton equation. And we look at it like this. That's how we visualize it. And as we have somewhat seen last week, if I don't put an obstacle anywhere, nothing will happen to this way. So our obstacle will be the half thing. So we let A be all real numbers such that x1 is greater than zero and x2 is equal to zero. So it's just the positive real x over here. So this is the thing. And also we should then expect some scattered field being reflected or maybe spread around the corner, something like this. But there will be something happening over here due to the presence of the obstacle. So mathematically, we then have the following bounded value problem. We have Helmholtz equation, which describes how our waves propagate in the absence of obstacles. And our hypothesis is that everything that we're looking at can be described by the Helmholtz equation. Particularly, this satisfies the Helmholtz equation as well. But at this point, it's a hypothesis. And of course, because this is in some sense applied mathematics, we want to have some confirmation that the hypothesis we made are useful. And we will hopefully see that today. So we have this, then we look at derivative boundary condition. You could also do the same for normal boundary conditions, but for gravity, I will only look at derivative boundary condition, which means. So derivative means that if we think of this as a sound wave, that the total sound is absorbed on H. The total wave here, as a reminder, 
is the sum of the incident plus the threat of it. So that is all the noise that we hear in the school because of the site or the acquisition. So all of this is absorbed on H, which means that the scatter here is equal to minus the incident here on H. Okay, as we have also seen last week, this by itself is not enough to give us a well post solution because we need some boundary condition at infinity. And last week we had um, a circle which was a compact scatter for which it was. Not easy, but easier than for this vector to define the radiation condition. So the problem with this is that it's unbounded. Intuitively, what that means, well, um, as you would expect from the physics, is that as this wave comes in here, some wave gets reflected over here just using classical ray optics, maybe. Or if you think of this as a mirror, if you put a laser on it, there is straight line away from it. But this will generally not exponentially decay. So we need to be a bit more careful as to how we shoot our weight on the obstacle to ensure that demanding that everything should decay exponentially even makes sense. And then we would expect a cylindrical weight from the corner. For this, it makes sense to impose that it decays exponentially. So this would be, so you can maybe think of this corner over here as a cylinder that you have just really, really, really compressed to a point. So for the wave that is only due to the interaction of this with that, it makes sense to impose the radiation condition as we, as we did last week. But for the whole scattered grid, which also takes into account the reflected components, it would not make sense. So long story short, what do we say is we say that for incident angle, Respected like this, and for positive imaginary part, which we call that's supposed to be a kappa, like this, um, there exists an epsilon which generally will depend on the incident angle, but it does not matter for us what exactly this epsilon is. Can you do that over here? Yeah. Uh, I must go over here. Yeah. So, but that, uh, yes, the scattered field is bounded like this. <laughs> and C is on us. Okay, so epsilon will depend on the incident angle, generally speaking, um, which again, using ray optics, you can think of as I change the incident angle, the reflected ray over here will also change. And when this decays, how it decays depends on the incident angle. But importantly, epsilon does not depend on kappa. So it does not depend on the imaginary part of our wave number. And we will discuss how to extend the solution we obtained for this condition for all incident angles next week, probably next week. Um, then we need to also specify what space our solution is given. So we say that. Valentin, you... sorry, what is the function phi again in this? Oh, process? sorry, that was absolutely wrong notation. That's you. That's wow. the U. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, I wrote five here. But so we have an explicit be... formula for the incident wave, yes. and we don't know what the scattered way is in yes. the explicit form, but we have this uh, qualitative behavior. Exactly. Okay, it decays exponentially. Yes. <laughs> and we also want that U scattered is H1 log. So thanks, David, because I would have written H2 if you wouldn't remind me that I'm actually looking at H1 functions. So do you know the Sobolev space H1? Okay. Either way, I will write down what this means explicitly in a moment. But we look at, so we want them to be locally H1 in all of R squared, and we want them to be C squared 
uh, C2 everywhere except on the scatterer. And this is a well post boundary value problem for a Heimovitz equation, which we will not prove. Um, but we will use this to show that a solution exists. And in all the steps, we will see that the solution must be unique. But you can also prove that a solution that satisfies all this must be unique. Um, I think you can either use Sachs Milgram, which will probably be a bit overplay for this type of problem. Um, you could just use two scatter fields that satisfy this behavior and look at the difference. And um, I think then you have to bound some integral equation where you use sort of everything and find that it has to be zero, for which you will need this decay. Um, so there's an R in that exponent, right? Yes, yes, over oh, right here. Okay. So that's that would be the variable. I mean, yes. key is a constant. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. And before we start solving the problem, um, I want to show you a short video as to when we look at a wave interacting with something like this, what would we expect to look at? So what should the wave field in the end look like? So I'll show you a video and then if time permits, at the end, I will show you plots of the solution that we obtained for this picture, and then we will see, oh, that's exactly what we would expect. So our theory seems to be somewhat um, meaningful. So let's hope that works. So our goal is to find an explicit formula for the scattered here. We are not so much interested in proving all of the things that you would probably be interested in pure mathematics. Um, so it's a double set experiment, but really, um, you know, it works roughly the same. Because it's just a bunch of half things. So, yeah, we have a wave. And so we have a cylindrical wave behind it. You don't really see the reflective fits but you see that some wave bends around the corner as it goes in there. So the gray wall would be the analog of your H obstacle here? Yes, so you would maybe want to look at only this corner over here. I see. And that's the yeah, that would be that. So if you would zoom in a lot and a lot and a lot, you would see it like this. Um, the video does not show the, um, the rays, which is well, in some sense, because you have a um, cylindrical wave coming onto it, but in good approximation on the scatterer, you could think of it as a plane wave. Because, like, if you look, the wave front is it, it's almost parallel to the screen, so it's roughly a plane wave, but it just doesn't show any reflected waves. So even for cylindrical wave, you would expect something to bounce off behind it, which it does not show. Um, but this is a best video I found, and I think it's a good video. So the point is, something bends behind the corner. That's that's the important takeaway of this video. And that's something that's reflected, I think you all believe, um, believe me when you think of a laser shining on a mirror. By the way, is this, this video, is it a simulation or is it an actual physical um, experiment? This is a simulation, but it's a simulation of the double set experiment uh -huh. that um, I think young did about 200 years ago. I see. So, so this experiment, and you can do it, but I wasn't brave enough to set up an experiment in this class. <laughs> uh, but you can maybe go and, you know, look at a big cup of water. Yes. And put some obstacle in and then give some harmonic water. excitation to the water. And that should hopefully give you a picture roughly like this. Interesting. But then you would, of course, have reflected waves from the outside of your bathtub, so it would probably look a bit messy. But anyway, that's the point. So we are trying. So we would hope that our scatter field that we would get from this theory resembles this behavior. Like as in over here, the it would bend somewhere around the corner. So that was the point of the video. Okay.
Do you have any questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, can you start with the uh, gateway of equation? Yeah. And we take the to be a transform. Yeah. Uh, we just try to be done. Yeah. So if we get the, uh, um, um, for any k, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, this uh, Elmer's uh, uh, equation. Mm -hmm. So um, is it is it a bit confusing because uh, usually we take uh, the linear form with respect uh, to the space variable? We will do that today. Sorry, we will do that today. Um, so last week it was just to remove time dependency in some sense, to be able to look at a problem that, um, that does not depend on time. In some sense, I don't know if you want to, you, I don't know if that's helpful, but you could think of the wave equation as Laplace equation in like with indefinite signature. So you could either think of wave equation as a Laplace equation, which is not positive definite necessarily, or you could think of an eigenvalue problem to the Laplace operator in U will R squared. So it's it's just a matter of preference, really. There is no, I don't think there's a right or wrong to, to, to this approach. Um, the reason why we want to do this is because physically, if you understand how the waves are scattered for one frequency, even if the wave that we encounter is not time harmonic in general, if we understand it for every single frequency, then we understand qualitatively how it behaves, even if we change the frequency. Because if you have a wave that goes like this and spreads around like this, then if we change the frequency, well, maybe it would look a little more like this, but the behavior should roughly stay the same, if that makes sense to you. So, so that's a bit of philosophy behind that. Also, there are formulas for if we have sort of first how you can use the solution to go back to the initial value problem and solve the wave equation. Um, I have not written the formula down, but it's on Wikipedia if you want to look it up. I think if you just look on Wikipedia wave equation a bit down the line is how um, by taking some suitable interval of this, you can recover solutions to your initial value problem. So really solving this is for this specific type of problem, the big difficulty. Does that answer your question? No. Um, also, I mean, mathematically, you can be happy with that and say, okay, well, now we have a well post boundary problem. You can also, but you set up H1 local. So this is the reason for this condition that if I have a small epsilon boy, center of zero, uh, that was, sorry, this is delta zero, then so this integral has to be bounded. And if you think of U as um, as a pressure for sound, this would correspond to potential energy physically. Well, it might not be here, right? you would have to um, adjust for the mass and all that, but um, that, that would just be a constant. So, um, if all of this, um, so maybe let's say it's proportional to potential energy, and this is going to be proportional to. Energy. energy. So this condition tells us that the total energy of our wave has to be bounded. Um, near, like everywhere, but especially near the, in some sense, singularity of our scatter. Like if I have a half plane like this, it's somewhat smooth everywhere, except at this problematic point. So at this problematic point, especially we want this to converge because everywhere except for the corner, we, we get this for free because of our thinking condition. So, really, the important part is that we need to additionally demand that. Oh, so okay. okay. Yeah. Neil is the bank. Uh, it's, it's just our step by point. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, so I will mostly outline how we do it, and um, but I'm going to go a bit more detail than I did last week. Uh, so hopefully, all that remains should be complicated, but not too difficult complications um, to carry out. So hopefully, you should, you should have an idea of how all of this works by uh, well, in a few hours. So now we do what we wanted to do last week. So let phi of alpha x2 be the Fourier interval of the scatter field in the x1 variable. The reason why we don't just Fourier integral over both variables is first. If we do it like this, we in some sense only have one complex variable. So as we will treat this as a function of a complex variable, if we would treat it as a function of two complex variables, this could be two Fourier intervals. We would have to deal with several complex variables, which we don't need to do at this point. So we would rather just work with just the complex analysis. But also, if we take the double Fourier integral, it is not so clear to me how you would meaningfully incorporate the boundary conditions. Because for this, you can incorporate the boundary conditions because in some sense, the transformation is of the same dimension as the scatter. But if you take a double Fourier integral, the scatter is just a line set. So it seems more natural also to take this transform, if that makes sense. And the idea is, of course, that we want to kill off one derivative in our PDE to get to an ODE for which we can write on a solution. But first, okay, what are the properties of this? So, does this explanation make sense to get to why we look at this type of interval? Anyway, it will turn out to be very useful to get like this. Um, properties. Oh, fine. Okay. So, first, we have that phi of alpha x2. You can write it. I will explain the subtopontation in a moment. Like this. Well, phi plus being just the integral of a positive free axis. X2 e is x1, e x1, and my mind is similarly just the integral of a negative axis. Okay, and the subscripts come from the following property that is, this function. So, if we think of x2 now as being fixed and we only look at this as a function of alpha, then this is. Oops. Another thing. In, Which we call UHP, so the upper ergodic transcend. 
and similarly that this is analytic in the clock. Is it clear about the reason why? Um, yeah, um, me. So, this is in some things clear because you can plug in a complex arrival over here. Then you can differentiate under the integral sign. Mm -hmm. And this is possible whenever alpha is in this domain because whenever alpha is in this domain, Due to our radiation, um, our radiation condition, the exponential decay of the scattered field. So we only, um, so we need to make sure that we can interchange the differentiation and the That's the problem, right? Because your integrand would be entire. Yes. Right? E to the i alpha x. Yes, but it does, but we are not necessarily allowed to change the, 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 the order. Okay, so you can do it in that uh, Absolutely. space because of the condition. On Absolutely, the and there you can just then check that, okay, I can take the derivative and I'm allowed to do that whenever alpha is in the domain, because whenever alpha is either here or here, either this or that integral respectively, will decay exponentially. The, the integrand will decay exponentially. Yeah. So that will always allow us to change the differential. Because the problem is to show analyticity, you have to be able to take the, the C bar derivative inside. Yeah, which, which we can do, assuming we are not okay. uh, Which we can do because, so that is one of the reasons why we wanted for well, this complex analysis that we, we, we want the scattered field to decay. Because this allows us to get some analyticity structure of these fields. Another way to prove it, if you know it, would be to use, um, I think it's Morena's theorem, where you take the integral over this. And then, because of the decay, you can swap the integrals, and then the integral will be zero. Whenever the triangle that you take from Morena's theorem, um, whenever this will be, um, this integral will converge, which it will be whenever we are in the upper half plane. If we would go to the lower half, then this would start to grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. So there we have absolutely no hope of this integral even making sense. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this analyticity, we have this analyticity. So what are the pictures? Well, um, something like this, right? We have our lower half then over here. We have our upper half then over here. Sorry, what was that on? Um, and particularly this bit in the middle, which will be important later on, is the domain of And, and whenever I speak of the word of analyticity, I mean only with respect to the first variable. So all of the complex analysis things that we're doing treats X2 as being a fixed parameter. So that means that this is analytic in some non-empty open domain in the complex number. So this is supposed to be C. So this is the first property. But the second property is that um, as the function of x2 phi is bounded, which you can again see using our radiation. And so this is again. But I, I didn't call it radiation condition, so due to exponential decay of the scattered field mm -hmm. within its domain of analyticity, that is. It is bounded. Mm -hmm. So in, in its domain of analyticity, it's bounded, but that's all we need to know for now. Okay. Um, 
Good. So we've been half an hour in, so I will go through the third property. Then we have a break, and then after the break, we will use the properties of five to solve the problem. Do you have any questions about these first properties at this point? So you're not gonna, you never send epsilon to zero on these arguments. Not at this point, no. No, no, no. Um, well, it would be a bit of a problem, right? Because then, of course, we, it still makes sense to speak of the Fourier transform, but we would have no domain of analyticity. Uh, so that's why, for this method, we really want the positive. Imaginary part. There is a way to do it for zero imaginary part where you would have to change your integral transform. Mm -hmm. um, and the transform would then vary with your wave number. So you can do it. Um, I always do it like this because I think having exponential decay is really awesome if you can get it, but you don't have to do it like this. Um, okay. Have you all written down what pi is? Can I re erase this? So we really will do that. Um, okay. Uh, so the third property for which I will outline the proof was this. I think it's not easy to see. Um, we have. Alpha zero oh, that's the third property that we can get pretty much directly from our physical boundary value problem. Intuitively, this is because and we will use that um, because the the near field behavior, as in the behavior of the scattered field near the orbit, is linked to how the corresponding Fourier transform behaves in the far field, like far field mm -hmm. Fourier space, if that makes sense. So that's the idea, and we will um, state the corresponding theorem later on. And um, right. so let's go through the proof roughly. So it will be an outline. Um, So, step one, which is, I think, the most difficult step, is. So, Valentin, by hmm. that claim, you mean that the limit is zero of phi alpha zero is alpha times. Yes. Um, in fact, um, you can show that it's of order one over okay. alpha. Um, I would like that down later, but uh, yeah, so this is not necessarily okay. this is not a precise statement, but. We will see roughly what the decay should be um, later on. So, step one is um, the scatter field being locally integrable. So, we will choose the step one after I have it Implies that the scatter field is minus one plus a. Times sine. So this is in polar coordinates. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's the first thing that we have to show. Okay, well, in a nutshell, it's because otherwise our integral would, um, would not be bounded. But getting this specific form is still a strong statement, and it's only true because we look at solutions to the Hamilton equation. Otherwise, uh -huh. so you this would not be true. The fact that U is a solution. Yeah, well, for Laplace's equation, it would also be true, but we need the differential equation. Yeah. So just take mm -hmm. one log alone, which would be not so we have to plus PDE and Pistons. Um, how do we do that? So,
So first, as we write the total field, which is scatter field plus incident field, as new total equals um, like this. We write our total field as the sum of vector functions. So these are the functions that we don't know, that like we, we treat it as if we know it because um, we know there are. So these are the Hunger functions we've seen last time. They are, and they spend the solution of the Bessel, the solution phase to the Bessel equation, which you obtain from the Helmholtz equation after using a separation of arrival and that's in radial and polar coordinates. And these co coefficients over here are from our um, angular um, um, ODE that we obtain. So it will be a sum of sine and cosine. I'll write it out in a second. And this will be the will be the two possible solutions to the radial equation. Um, good. So you write it down like that. Only thing, uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's a stupid question, but what does it mean that uh, as r goes to zero, the scatter cube goes to minus one? What does that mean? Um, Can you give like a geometric interpretation or something? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's um, if this is r and uh, oh sorry, if this is r and this is the scatter here. This is minus one. Um, but what does it mean in terms of the wave? Does it have any meaning in terms of the wave? Yeah, the wave approaches this one value at zero. So it's like it's, it's an asymptotic behavior, right? I, I, I try to write here probably. Yes, this I understand. Yeah, well, that's that's all it says. I mean, if there's a physical. Um, yeah, the physical interpretation is that the energy is bounded. But that's no, I'm, I'm I'm not I'm not sure what your question is. I think. Okay, <laughs> then forget it. Okay, well maybe we can talk a little bit more about this in the brain. Yeah. Okay. Um. So we do this, and then with P and J. Okay. Yeah. Being some a n j time new n plus um p n j cosine new n okay so this is the first thing that we do for the first step with which we outline the proof then. So we just write it like this, which we know we can we can always do after using a separation of variety and plus. Then um, I should mention it's not so straightforward to kill off one or the other uncle function in this case. So when we looked at the cylinder, we could use the radiation condition um, straightforwardly to kill off one of these two. But um, now we also need it to be, we, we have an additional condition at the origin. The problem is that these Hunter functions are singular at the origin. So if we would just kill one off, we would be left with a field that logarithmically blows up at the origin. So we cannot just remove one and use this to solve our differential equation. So in the far field, as we let R go to zero, we know that far away from the spectra, we can kill one off. But even that is not completely true. Well, probably, probably this, but I haven't, 
I didn't think about this. But the point is that because we are, um, yeah, the, the point is if we would just do the same that we did last week, we would get the function that really horribly blows up by geology. So that would be an unfounded energy integral. So long story short, we can't do exactly what we did last week. So the origin in this case, it's the yeah. edge of the obstacle, yes. right? So do we are looking at how the function behaves when we zoom in? Absolutely. Yes. That was my question. Oh, oh okay. okay. Oh, sorry. So we now use the boundary condition at theta equals zero and theta equal two pi. And the independence of H one and H two to find TJ equals zero. Uh, and that sign to n to pi r equals zero for all n. So this is what we find. So we know how we can. So this is to fix these first unknowns new n, which we get from our boundary conditions. Um, well, the third step, um, it's probably not going to be really helpful, but what we do is we use the okay, yeah. So um, I don't write the behavior down because um, it would be, in fact, that we would want to use combinations of these functions such that one of these combinations removes the singularity, which away from the singular point works perfectly fine. Um, but you can also just use series extensions and other sort of behavior of the Hunter functions to show um, essentially you can write this as a power series. But um, the um, yeah, sorry. so the idea is that we write h one and half as a sum like that. So that's the idea. So that a n is a coefficient times k r. So it's a fractional series. Um, but you can look up like series differences for vector functions are written down all over the internet. So um, what you do is you write it like this, then you sort you put all of this in here. Um, you then look at the condition that the energy in the real needs to be bounded, which will give you a constraint on the exponents that are allowed to appear in the series. So that will say, OK, the first n, so negative n's, must all vanish, which um, well, which, which we've already established anyway. But um, so the first one is 0. 0 is allowed. And I think I, think I messed up because it should only be the energy condition that allows us to say that we have no um, times. Yes. So this should be like this. So why did I mess up? Because I labeled this and the same as this end. So this I can always start counting at zero because it's definitely countable. So I can always reorder my sum to write it like this. Um, but then these new ends, so I could probably, 
right? You get the idea. This condition tells us it could all be like this. So you could have negative powers in here, which can still be labeled true by n. So I told you. Are you next? Sorry. Do you understand the idea? So from this solution, we, we do get negative, but, um, negative values for new n. So we get potential negative values in here. If this would be our, so maybe if instead of, so I would write new n here, you would get that new n could be negative a priori, then using the energy condition. So using the energy condition I mean x1. Find that all u n must be greater than zero, because if we would have negative powers in in here, if we would use the negative sign, then our energy integral would not be um, would not be bounded. So then we use to fill this off, and um, well, and then you can check that okay, well, but if I start at zero, it does convert, and if I go to higher powers, it, it just converts better. So. Using this, we find eventually that the scatter field is minus one plus a sine theta uh, uh, one half uh, term of pi uh, order. So this, this, and this is how we get this one half and the zero over here. These coefficients we get from um, this over here. Um, after using boundary conditions and everything to boil it down to this. Um, and yeah, that's it. So that's not the rigorous proof, but that's the idea of how you would prove that. So the, to reiterate, the idea of how you prove that is you expand your total here um, like this. We do that because we know the asymptotic the asymptotic behavior of Let's summation. Yes. Does the H ones give the scattered uh, field, and the H two gives the in incident field? No, no. So that that two pieces are not U scattered and the no. incident at all. No. Okay. So we do that. Um, <clears throat> Simply because, yeah, because we know the asymptotic behavior of the of, the, of these um, resonant functions. So we can just look it up. Um, so it's really good to study this type of behavior if you can find a function for which you know the behavior that you're looking for. Um, then we use the boundary condition to determine all of the indices in here, which are not a priori clear. Then we use the asymptotic behavior of our resonant functions. And we use the condition that the scattered field must be um, locally integral. Um, so you would want to use it for the total field, actually, because this expansion we have done for the total field. But the incident wave is absolutely locally integral around the corner. So that poses no problem. And then, because of the, um, that restricts the new end over here, that gives you a condition. For the total field, and then when well, you just look at how does the incident wave behave near the origin, um, you subtract it from the total field, and then you just get up to it. So, so that's the idea. But we use everything. We use PDE, boundedness. We use everything except our radiation. Can you help me understand like the main idea? Sure. So what we are trying to prove is that so phi is the um, is the Fourier transform so yeah. it captures the frequencies of the function in the x1 variable, right or not? Yeah. So if we want to prove that phi vanishes as alpha goes to zero, we are proving that. I would not think of very... the frequency. I know what you mean, but uh, the frequency has nothing to do with this anymore. So... Because the frequency is something physical, and you just look at the spatial Fourier transform now. So I okay. get what you mean. But so it's um, about some type of oscillation or something of the function, right? Or not in this variable? Um, yes, 
but let's think of alpha as a complex parameter. Okay. It's just um, anyway because we, we want to prove that phi goes to zero as alpha goes to infinity, yes. and somehow this boils down to studying the origin. Yes, we will finish the proof after the break. Okay. So we can let's just come to that maybe in the break. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would say maybe let's make a pause until 25 or 30, and then um, let's finish this. So, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that, you know, this is not like, I'm happy to discuss everything now, but um, we still have a break now. So, go to the bathroom, eat food, whatever people do. Um, Everyone yes. Yes. No. No. You're not. So we need we need to update the WhatsApp group. Maybe David yeah. can do that. So. So. Um. So this phi is studying some properties of U, right? When uh, alpha goes to zero, this is studying some properties of U that. Are captured by phi or not? No, we look at this as alpha goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. This captures the property of u as r goes to zero. What I thought we were doing is that if phi goes to zero as alpha goes to infinity, this must happen because u is somehow well behaved. And therefore, proving this would boil down to proving. The scatter field, uh, studying the scatter field at the origin, because this is a problematic point. Oh, sorry, second. I thought that by proving that this goes to zero, it's also going to go to infinity, would we'll boil down to proving that u is somehow well behaved. Yes. And no, this is and this, right. and proving that u is well behaved boils down to studying the origin, because this is the more problematic yeah. point yeah. of the scatter field. Yeah. Because the incident is yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's completely okay. correct. Yeah. So we, it's not frequency, but the idea is the is the same, right? We are yeah. getting some property that for this to go to zero, you have to be yeah. behaved and it's brought down to something. I, I, I know what you mean by frequency because um, I just don't want to call it frequency mm -hmm. because physically it's wrong. Physically, physically for us, the frequency yeah. is in our wave number k already. Yeah. Um, but if you would do it more abstractly and not worry so much about what you physically then yes, that's that's what we are doing now. Because if if this did not happen, like for example, if it was equal to one at for alpha very large, then you would be I think this would break the assumption that uh, U is in H1. Sorry, thank you. If this was if this was not the case, that uh, phi did not go to zero. For example, if phi was equal to one for a very large. No, then it would not then be. Yeah. It would not be in H1, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we will. I will write down the theorem for this during the break. So. Um, but but you're absolutely right. So. Okay. So I think I understood how the I messed up before because they don't hear and then you can make your So don't worry, I will just write something down to tell me to So I thought you were asking why are we taking our going to zero well after you know I don't know. You understood why uh, the heat condition of minus one. Okay. Uh, I mean, um, I just remember while you're here, I wanted to show you some plots of the field that we computed last week. The field. Yeah, of the, um, of, um, you know, where we had the Hunter function and everything like last week. Um, it's going to be completely. Um, well, it's, it's not going to be really relevant for today. Oh my gosh, how do I? Uh, uh, how do I access my USB stick on this? You don't know. 
Uh, such a mess. Um, I always just pulled it off, and I never had any problems. I never said anything. Good. Uh, uh, hopefully that would work. Yeah. Uh, do 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 Okay. Well, I don't understand the details because I'm not. Well, also I have not shown you. Any <laughs> no. I'm just more worried about the general idea. So, um, no. Also, if I would show you the details, this half-time problem would be its own cost mm -hmm. in its own right. Um, anyway, this is the plot that we get if we put everything that we did last week into MATLAB. Um, we have our way coming from down here. Okay, this is the coding field. For the red boundary conditions, which physically means that the sound is completely absorbed from here. So you would expect to find very, very little behind that. Uh, it was very isolating. Uh, which you see, right? There are still some ways behind it, but really not so much. Um, so I don't know, I think this picture looks probably how you would what, what you would expect if you put the cylinder in a leg and you drop a stone at one end of the leg, how the waves spread from the cylinder. So what does that show? Well, it's a confirmation again that all the assumptions that we made last week lead to a reasonable result. Also, doing everything that we did last week it leads to something that is. Well, I don't want to say easily computable, but it's something that computers know how to compute. So it is practically useful to have a solution, as we found last week, to study this type of, um, of behavior. Even if it's all frozen in time, I think the picture gives some good understanding of how, you know, where would you expect something. And you can vary the frequency and everything, so you can look at the plot for different wave number if, if you want to. And because it's really fast computation, you can use this to, you know, get some better understanding of how waves behave. Um, we have what the boundary condition you propose. There we About what function does the wave learner must uh, achieve when it touches the zero? The total zero. wave is zero. Right. It's homogeneous. Yes, it's always homogeneous. It's 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 problem that we studied last week. So where the sum of incident and scattered field is zero. So the scattered field um, is equal to minus the incident field, and the scattered field only is what we see up here. Okay. So, so that's the scattered field, which is for inhomogeneous directly condition. And as you see, this is very, very strong behind the um, behind the obstacle, um, which is exactly what we want, because we want the scattered field and the incident field to cancel each other out behind the obstacle. Because in our model, our incident field is it's everywhere. So the scatter field should, if our model is correct, cancel it out behind here, which is exactly what it does. Um, so we have not seen it last week, but I also can show you the plot for directly, uh, sorry, Neumann, homogeneous number boundary conditions, um, where the um, field itself does not need to vanish, but the normal derivative must vanish. And here you see, in fact, a lot more wave behind the obstacle. So if not, if the pressure is not absorbed on the boundary, you do have in fact more wave behind the boundary, which also I think intuitively makes sense. Um, yeah, so these are just some pictures I wanted to show you. Um, if we manage to get to the solution of this problem, I will also show you pictures for the half time problem, um, maybe in half an hour or so, but maybe we don't, don't get there yet. Um, Anyway, so this problem it can also be solved. Uh, otherwise, everyone is adopting a whole class of steps. Not important. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> small um, so let's continue. What we now use 
this year I will not do, but you can look it up and um, I can also write down, yeah, let, let me do it like this. I will write down references where you can look up the details in the WhatsApp. Um, so the, the theorem is the following. If f of r is asymptotic to t of r, as r goes to zero, so I put it in quotation marks, but there, you know, everything that I will say makes sense. So all the functions need to be sufficiently well behaved, which our functions absolutely, absolutely are. So our functions are a class of functions that fits the restrictions that you would need to write down for the zero, but for gravity, I will not write down all these functions that go into this. But roughly, you can think of it like this. If one function behaves like another function, S R in here goes to zero, then the Laplace transform, which is the half range Fourier interval, so the corresponding half range Fourier transforms are also as important. But now, as that goes to infinity in the domain. So that goes back to your question in the brain that indeed there is a theorem generally that tells you that behavior of two functions at zero is directly linked to the behavior of these half range Fourier transforms at infinity. Um, so Use this and let's call this star. Use this and star to find phi plus. So it is written for the positive way transform, but um, you can also look at, um, sorry, by positive, I mean positive range for your transform. But if you would have the interval from zero to minus infinity, you can just substitute. An integral of this form and then use the theorem again. So it's not really important that it goes from zero to infinity, but it's important that it's for half range wave transforms. Um, And this is the narrow spectral domain. So when alpha goes to infinity, anywhere in this upper half, then that we written down earlier, or to um, infinity at the lower half plane, then both of these functions vanish. And in fact, so how we do that is we use this theorem and we just plug in this formula at the one side of the equation. And that gives us the expansion for the Fourier theorem. So and integrating this over R is, um, that doesn't take much time. Um, this theorem, in fact, itself, I think is not complicated, and I don't think it's something that people see in um, you know, courses on um, classical complex analysis, which, which really is a shame because it's a very useful theorem, I think. Um, anyway, so for specifically, you can show that phi plus or minus of order one over n. So, because we know exactly what the exponents here are, so we can really explicitly find the asymptotic behavior of the fields as um, alpha goes to infinity. Um, and this will be very important later on. And I think that are uh, all the three conditions that we need. It. So, let me write it down again. It's um, for the properties. Of pi r. So we will use all of these properties now. Uh, that one phi um, plus and phi minus. Uh, so I omit the argument, but think of everything as having a complex context variable, except when I tell you explicitly that it does not. Um, uh, and then you take an upper half plane 
and lower half of n with factor d to find the bounded in x2, x3, pi plus one x squared x the same. Let's write it down here. You don't have to write all of these numbers just to um, keep track of all these properties. Okay, so. Have you all written the sum? Is that the big O notation? It's a big O. Okay. We all know the big O notation. Okay. Have you all written down the things on the right? Yeah. Ready? So. What we're going to do now, finally, it's bigger than our PDE. So, which we could have done earlier as well, but um, so it's, it's a matter of track of what going to do. Yes. So, from this, we find the dx squared plus a squared minus alpha squared by alpha x2 equals zero, from which we find that phi must be something like this. A of alpha e i square root a squared minus alpha squared oops x2 plus d alpha e minus i a squared minus alpha squared x2. Okay, uh, let me just put the like this. So first, we have already seen that phi is analytic in some domain that extends beyond the real x, so in some open um, domain within the complex numbers. Uh, so, of course, we can specify what we mean by the square root over here. And for this, um, well, any choice of square root would be valid, but um, the square root that we choose will, well, I will explain the choice after I bring that down. So, um, we, well, maybe, is that supposed to be a u again? The scattered? Yes, uh, no, uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, and then you get the. Uh... Yeah, this time it was correctly written in my notes. I know. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, of course, in all of my PFP, I put the scatter field phi. Um, but for this type of problem, it's more common to call it U, so I wanted to stick with the little thing. It looks like you're choosing both of the roots down there, right? One goes down. Right here, yeah, so this is just the general solution to this. Right. So we have one choice of roots on the for the A part yes. and the other choice. Yes, absolutely. So every choice would be valid. Exactly, exactly. So but that means we have absolute freedom as to how we want to choose it at this point. Mm -hmm. So we choose square root that's called a bed. Um, that's called the square root argument. Uh -huh. Um, such that this always has non negative imaginary part, meaning that we choose the square root such that the argument of that is in zero. Okay. Because on the real axis, we wanted to agree with our usual square root function. Uh -huh. So, um, are you all happy with like this notion of choosing a branch and, and all? So, that's mean that you're taking uh, from as so the square root of z always has non negative imaginary part. Yes. 
But and it is it is zero only on the real uh, on the real axis. So if I'm thinking of the way it's defined, it's like e is e to the one half. So it's e to the yeah. one half log z. Yes. Um, e well, to I, the one half log z. I would write it like this. Right. And then the square root would just be if I have that. Right. But and now the argument over here is a non-zero. Zero. To pi. So this will yeah, always have non negative dimensional part, right? Because this will always be in the upper half. And uh -huh. if this is E, then it will always be. Um, so this the argument will always be from here all the way the up to here. Way. So in, you're in the upper half plane. Exactly. Right. So this is this is what it means. We choose the square root <laughs> like this. Uh -huh. And because we have restricted phi to be in this interval, this is the unique. <coughs> I can, if you're interested, I can show you some um, face per face, maybe not now, but um, I can post it in the group of this function and also of this function, because this function has a branch on the positive real axis, which we would expect. But if you look at this function, square root of k squared minus alpha squared, it has two branch cuts starting at well, plus k and minus k, as you would expect. But then the, these branch cuts go uh, something like this, which is essentially because here you take the square. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that they look like this? You plot them. But even without plotting them, you can prove that um, you know one must be in the upper half like completely and one in the lower. And then you can say, see that, OK, one starts here and asymptotically approaches this, and the other approaches this. Um, but the important part is that for us, this thing always has some negative imaginary part, and it is analytic in some neighborhood of the real axis, uh, which is pretty much also what we would have expected from phi in the first place. And again, it is important that our wave number k has some positive imaginary part, because otherwise, the singularities move on our real axis. But this we will discuss. Um, in the next session. So for now, these are our properties. But now, because of, um, sorry, that was a bit too early. Um, no, sorry, that was exactly right. Because of two, we now know that, so we know that phi always has to be bounded as a function of x2. But we also know that we can plug in alpha such that this has some non negative, non zero imaginary part. But then, if phi is bounded as a function of x, it means that the thing that one of these two will blow up as x2 goes to infinity. One will exponentially decay, the other one will exponentially grow. And we know that the one that exponentially grows, we must discard. So, this is why we have this choice of square root, so that we have this very clear distinction of one grows, the other decays. So, long story short, you will find that it is this. For x2 smaller than 0, and p of alpha p minus i plays back. x2 for x2 greater than 0. OK. Now, due to our boundary condition, we just get one of the um, So I think you call it being even in the last coordinate. Uh, how you do that is because you write you write the scatter here as the sum of its even and its odd part like relative to the last coordinate. And the odd bit will satisfy our boundary value problem, but with homogeneous theoretical conditions. So it will satisfy Helmholtz equation. So the odd part will satisfy the Helmholtz equation. It will satisfy the, rate, um, the decay at infinity. And it satisfies homogeneous um, theoretical condition. And it is in H1 over but there is only so so that means it must be zero because there is only one solution to this problem and it's going to be zero. 
So this is how you show that this can be towards you write it as a sum of its even and odd part and show that the odd part satisfies homogeneous equations. And then you use the keys. So we find this. Um, this will be relevant in a second because so at multiple points. First, we find that A must be equal to B using the definition of phi using the symmetry. A must be equal to B for all alpha. Um, so I should probably write A of alpha is equal to B. Probably like this. Um, now, for notation, really just for simplicity, we said psi plus minus to B equal to one half, and again, the one half is for making the computations less messy. Um, DDX squared prime plus minus, so here plus minus, here plus minus, minus P, PXY, uh, sorry, PX2 um, plus minus, and we immediately find that this is equal to zero because of this. Just um, what was that definition? It looks like you're doing something minus the same thing. Am I missing something in that parenthesis? Maybe it should be minus. Yes. Um, also minus minus plus. No, it, I'm sorry, but this is a good point. So I write this zero, alpha zero. Ah, okay. It's a jump. Yes, exactly. It's uh, the jump it's across the, the scatter. Okay. Um, and phi minus is equal to zero because the scattered here is even in the last coordinate. Uh -huh. um, to see this, just write down the definition. So the S over there in the notation for oh, this, the, uh, you mean, scattered. okay, it's just the even, it's just the- It just says that the scattered is even. That's the even, uh, so you're saying that that Minus the other thing is zero. Yeah, so the scatter field is it's even. just even. So you're using the fact that the scatter field is even. Yes. Purely even. So its odd part must be zero. Exactly. And that means precisely that. Also, because if you have a, if, if the field is even, then it's derivative. Oh, sorry, that would be x1 and x2. Well, I guess it doesn't matter in here, but mm -hmm. so the derivative of an even function is not a function. So that's why this would be zero if you use this in the definition. Okay, so why do we do this? We do this because um, da, 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 da. Again, the odd part um, must be zero because it solves a Dirichlet problem with boundary condition zero. Yes. Right. So by uniqueness. Yes, absolutely. Okay, we get this um, pretty much from this. So you look at this now at x2 equals zero. Um, and uh, this is just the equation that you get with this. So you just do it exactly what we have over here. Take the derivative in the x2 direction, which you get over here, and find this relation. Um, I don't know if there's an intuitive, I, I know there is a mystery on, so all of this, what we're doing right now, is called the Wiener Hopf technique, but it was developed in a very different setting. So um, I don't know if there's any good intuition as to why we do that other than it is in some sense the algorithm that the technique provides. Um, and we will see that this is super useful and elegant and maybe a bit like magic at the beginning. But if you do it sufficiently many times, it's um, you know it's just a matter of seeing it over and over and over again. 
Anyway, using the boundary condition that the scattered field must be equal to minus the incident field on the positive half plane. The positive half plane, remember, is exactly what we integrate over in this bit here. It's the integral over the positive real axis for x2 equals zero. So this, using the boundary condition, you find is exactly equal to i over alpha minus k cosine <coughs> theta n. Okay, so let's <laughs> So this is what we can commonly refer to as we now have the question. So in some sense, the idea behind all of this is to convert the boundary value problem in the real physical variables into a problem that only depends on functions in a complex variable, in some sense using the boundary condition and the PDE we find a functional equation linking the two unknowns, which are phi minus and psi plus, by this equation in the common domain of analyticity, and using the additional physical condition that we needed to ensure that the problem is well posed, we find these properties that translate to properties for these unknowns. So that's the whole idea. We use everything that we know in the physical space to find a problem that we can solved by using complex analysis. That's the idea. Um, and why is that better? Because complex analysis is super powerful and functions in a complex variable are very, very rich. Especially if we have now two functions where we know that this is analytic in one half of the complex plane and this is analytic in the other half of the complex plane. Sorry, this should be like this. this, should be like this. Um, and we know that they should decay as we let this go to infinity. So it almost looks like we could maybe use this equation to do some analytic continuation to get a function that would be entire as in holomorphic in the whole complex plane and decays. And then it must be zero because and, um, complex functions are so rich, so value is zero. So the only problem that prohibits us from using this equation for analytical continuation of either continuing this bit to um, all of the complex plane, or then is that this and that, um, these functions are not analytic. In, so if this was analytic in the upper half plane and this was analytic in the lower half plane, we could use this equation for analytic continuation. But that's not the case. So how we do that is, um, well, essentially, it's, you know, of the parts that destroy it and or that prohibit you from doing analytic continuation, they know explicitly. So you can play around with it and try to split it into things that have your analyticity properties, the ones that you want. So what do we do is um, <clears throat> so to solve this equation. We write it as okay. It's it's going to be ugly, but it's going to be very worth it. Trust me. So we have this, and of course you need to be a bit careful when you factor the square root. But because of how we chose the bound of our square root, we can really write this as a product of this and this. Um, so that's how the square root appears here. And again, in general, you need to be careful when factorizing square roots in the context number, but keeping with our choice of branch, it will work. Um, so here, the idea is to remove the pole. Um, and yeah, so. We factor this, we bring one bit over to the other side, and then we have to remove the singularity of what we get on the left hand side to split it into something less analytic up and below. So that's how we get all of this. Um,
Okay. So there we go. It's really not looking nice, but um, so I call it this over here. I just call left hand side and this over here. I get it. So, but now this left hand side is analytic. In our lower okay, over here. And this over here is analytic. And now uh, in our upper. Okay. And as we have seen, like an hour ago, the intersection of the LHD and the UHD is an open set in the context plane. So, therefore, we find that. The function, which we say for E of alpha, which is LHS as alpha is in the lower plane and blue S as alpha is in the upper plane. So this function is entire, it's holomorphic and it's defined on all of C. And then using this asymptotic behavior of phi, which gives you asymptotic behavior of psi. Um, well, and that we know all of the um, asymptotic behavior of the remaining country physically. So we can show using three E of alpha goes to zero. And now alpha goes to infinity, like wherever in the context plane. So this is where this condition becomes important, which again is because our function is in H1 local. So making it of a stretch, the condition that our energy remains bounded at the tip of our scatter leads to this thing going to zero. Well, and now we can apply you with zero. But it should be right hand side in the second one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. But not, 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 not upper hand side. <laughs> that should be now. Um, so anyway. I never realized that left hand side and right hand side are the same initials as left half space and right half space. Oh, terrible. <laughs> that yeah. actually is terrible. It is. But for the purpose of today, yes. it's this. Um, just because really no one wants to write this down. Right, right, right. So, but now we are done. So now, so now the value is zero. So we find that e must be equal to zero. So that is equal to 